Meow. All right. Okay. Eduardo, introduce yourself for uh, everyone that's going to watch this someday. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, man. I really appreciate it to be here with you. Uh, I was told you before, uh, it's uh, hard for me to don't be in the bar in front of you talking and uh, having a cocktail. Uh, you are very talented, by the way, about this, uh, <laughs> about this skill. And uh, well, uh, I am super happy to do it in this way, in this uh, little impersonal way, but it's really nice to have a, a conversation. So my name is Eduardo. I have been part of the mezcal industry since 2008, when we started a company called Oaxaca Mezcal in uh, uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. We associate ourselves with a five generation of master distiller, Alberto Morales and uh, his family. And uh, we put the first bottle of mezcal in 2010 in Austin, Texas. And since then, uh, we are growing a little bit each year. Uh, right now, we are in 30 states of, um, in America, and um, we are still independent. So we own from the uh, agave fields to uh, myself, that is the last point. So the agave field is the first part, right? And the last part is here when I present my, my products to uh, the public. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have an uh, uh, um, importer to bring us here, but uh, since then, uh, over them, we have the, the, the other sides of, of the company uh, owned by, own by us. And I think it's a great value for our company. So my, my, my job is uh, present and try to give value to, uh, in the eyes of the consumer to our product. Mezcal is very, very complex spirit. So you, we understand very fast that we need to explain it. And that uh, is what I'm doing. And I mean, to, like, this is going to be weird and we're going to kind of go through all this. But for me as a bartender, like, I'm used to having you right where you are right now. Like, I've set the camera up to be on the other side of the bar. Um, this is a very natural place for me to be in. In the sense that, like, you would come into a bar and you would sit down and there would be a bartender in front of you. And you got to teach and talk about your mezcal and you know your family and your heritage and everything to me as a bartender and i got to either go okay whatever or be like that's super cool dude like i, I love your stuff and then you know either you know me as the owner bring it in and use it or um as a bartender ask an owner or ask the bar manager to bring it in so it was something that it was a very personal thing and then i got to turn around and tell every guest and customer that came into the bar and be like hey you really need to try this mezcal it's super awesome but it was this very like small one-on-one -on -one interaction and now in COVID we're kind of being forced to rethink our entire lives and whatnot. This thought occurred to me in the sense of like I no longer have an opportunity to teach and show guests what are really amazing authentic cool brands that are you know what they preach they are and instead I get to sit here and watch commercials and and propagandas put out by companies that I don't necessarily value a lot. I don't think, you know, I don't believe are true and honest and in integrity. And so I wanted to start to think about how can I connect with these brands that don't have necessarily the money to just be like, hey, boy, our crap. And, and say, okay, okay, talk about yourself. Talk about like why your brand is important, why it deserves a place on every person's back bar in their home where they can make cocktails and where I can just go, oh, we'll make your mezcal cocktail. And if you have, you know, whatever your mezcal at home has, and then most people are like, oh, well, I got Oaxaca, mm -hmm. I got Von Hez, I got Bozal, whatever. Then, you know, we can start that conversation and people at home can realize that there are brands that are just better than other brands because they're more authentic, because they're honest, because they're open. And that's why I really am excited to talk to someone like you who, who can have this conversation open and honest and just be like, and have an opinion and say, you know, what you feel and what you think and what you've seen. And then also, you know, towards I want the end of our conversation to be like, this world's fucked up. It's burning, literally, um, especially in Oregon, but also like thinking about climate change. And I mean, when talking with, you know, another Mezcalero who I won't necessarily mention right now, I mean, I both know who it is. Like he was, he was fairly optimistic and, and didn't think that Oaxaca was currently undergoing much in the climate change and because of the micro climate that it is, which if that's the case, awesome. That's really cool. That's not necessarily been the case earlier. So I'd like to also have a little bit of a conversation of where do you see the future of Mezcal going with climate change, with our world being turned upside down? And, you know, how can we bartenders, how can we, the people, help 
make sure that it is, it is a protected thing and it's not, it doesn't go down the same pathway that I see tequila going down. And to me, that is one of the saddest things to see is a company lose the kind of the, the special, what it makes it special and the, to give way to the technology like a diffuser and additives and all those things. And, you know, I, I, tequila was and still is an amazing spirit and I'm, I love my tequila, don't get me wrong, but I see the pressure that that industry is under to make it cheaper and to make it more consistent and to make it more, for lack of a better term, whitewashed for the American palate. And it makes me really sad. And so I really, I want to start documenting these things because I don't want Mezcal to follow the same tracks or fall into the same traps. And so one, you know, thank you so much for, for being here and thank you for your open, you know, open honesty and your transparency with Oaxaca and yourself. And I, I, I look forward to this conversation. So, I mean, first off, like tell us, tell me and, and anyone who ever watches this, uh, those poor souls, um, you know, Oaxaca, like tell us about, what makes mezcal like why is mezcal so cool um and what makes it different than tequila well uh something that is really cool in mezcal is i think is this is uh, the secret of the success of the mezcal you know they're growing very fast in in, in um uh, in the palate of the people and they really want it and uh, you, you as a bartender being the front line i'm pretty sure you are uh, someone to receive the people say what is mezcal Right. Uh, I have a neighbor to tell me about mezcal. Uh, I see a program. I see. I saw a documentary. Uh, my son tell me about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and you know, it's because around mezcal we have this romanticism. It's a lot of romanticism to see uh, the people they was uh, forgot, the people they was in the mountains living in a high poverty, finally get some uh, social justice. Uh, finally be able to show their art because uh, make mezcal is like a make a whiskey, make an art, right? And um, part of the success in the United States is that, you know, you are a fantastic uh, artisans in America. You do the fantastic whiskeys and bourbons, right? But in, in, in Mexico, we do also this great spirit with agave and we also made it by hand. So this is something they put us together. When you see the, your customers of, of, of mezcal, they are not tequila drinkers. The tequila drinkers are already have their mind and they are loving the mezcal and tequila and it's very rare they, they change or maybe they love both. But they are your whiskey lovers. They, oh, those are the kids, they are really feeling like the mezcal is their thing because it's very similar to whiskey. Is made by an artisan, is made by hand. A difference of the whiskey, the whiskey came better in the barrels, but the mezcal came better in the plant. Do you know what that, I mean? That's one of the key things. Like I look at like um, whiskey and I mean, it, it's, it's so sought after. People want those, you know, amazingly rare bottles of whiskey, whether it be bourbon or rye or scotch or Japanese or Irish or whatever. And I kind of go up and I go, you know, as amazing as there are, there's certain whiskeys out there that I really love and I enjoy drinking. It's kind of lost its luster to me because if you think about it, corn, it's all homogenized. It's all the same corn. There's no, you know, it's a, um, what's the word for it? It's, it, there's, um, it's only one crop. And yes. same with the rye, same with the barley. There's nothing unique about it. It's, and then if with the whiskey build, you know, for especially American bourbon, you have to have 10% barley in that mixture. And that's just so you have the right amount of enzymes that naturally reside in the barley to be able to convert the starches mm -hmm. into sugar. And if you don't do that, then you're going to have to add the enzymes artificially afterwards. And what was explained to me is when you add enzymes artificially, it breaks up the sugar molecules into one molecule. And so it's not very complex. It doesn't really create any good flavor. Whereas if you let the enzymes naturally do it from the barley, you get much more complex uh, sugars, which then create a much better whiskey. So you get like the big brands like Woodford or Brown Foreman or whatever. And they're always going to have that 10% barley in there just so they have that enzyme. And after that, everything, I mean, you can, we can sit here and we can romanticize about the difference between, you know, 5% corn or 5% rye or oh, five, how many years in the barrel, yeah. whatever. And at the same time I go, okay, aging is aging inside of an oak barrel is adding a new ingredient two new ingredients to be precise. It is thyme and it is oak. And mm -hmm. oak is going to give you vanillins and caramel and these things. And thyme is going to give you a softening and a alignment of the chains that are the alcohol. 
Now, in America, we don't have the temperature structures to actually allow aging to happen for very long before the, the infusion takes over. And so yeah. you get these, these bourbons that people... So, so let, let, let me stop you uh, there because I think I, I can add something that is very valuable in this, yeah. in this conversation. So it's uh, happened as some, some things are very similar in, in mezcal. So it's not the same get a uh, five-year-old agave than get an eight-year-old agave. Mm -hmm. right because it's the same reason you will have in eight years old agave you will get much more sugars much more complexity the agave will be totally much more ready to to to, to be uh prepared right a five years old uh you are hurry because the boom of the mezcal because it's cheaper yeah. so you will not get the same quantity of sugar and 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 from there we go into the roasting part when you roast your, your agave is not the same Keep it for three, four days, or keep it to five days. Sometimes it's not dictated by the by the producer; it's dictated by the weather, right? And also, when you prepare your your peat, you need to put it a, a, an exactly good amount of most of a previous distillation to get this humidity that your uh, peat needs. So yeah. we start talking about the little recipes there, right? So and after when you mill it, uh, yeah. you have to mill it. And yeah. when you mill it, it's not the same flavor when you mill it by a uh, bat or when you mill it by canoe or when you mill it by tajona, but also not only depend the system that you will use in that depend of the size of the pieces of agave that you will left for your fermentation part, yeah. right? So this is another recipe. So when you go in, in, your, in your fermentation, there is very important that you have a consistency of the weather, right? Because they the yeast love weather they, they love warm so when you have a change of temperature in your uh open bath for ferment the the, the agave uh this is very important that you can keep this consistency of the flavor at the end will be not the same and when you stop it. so that is another point the last time i went in oaxaca i tried a mezcal there was a little pass so the master distiller let them pass a little bit and they have a little flavor of tepache, delicious, right? But it's very risky because if you let her a little more, your mezcal will be destroyed, right? So you need to know exactly when you get it out. And, and when you get it to the distiller, uh -huh. and in the distillation also the temperature is very important. And most important is what you will discard and what you will keep. A lot of brands, they love to keep a lot of uh, heads and a lot of uh, tails. For example, Alberto, my master distiller, he just to love the body. And I say, oh, man, what are you doing with this? I discarded, oh my God, you, we need to do hand soap or something. We cannot discard all this stuff. What are you doing? No, I don't like my mezcal with tails and heads and I will keep this recipe forever. Okay. So each one, they will keep their own recipe and they are the master distillers and you don't have the right to say <laughs> zero, right? But this is what they look like, like me, like whiskey. When you're a really great producer of whiskey, right, and you have the, the good uh, amount of time, and when you have passions, when you have talent, when you have the, the barrels that you need, you will get a really great product. It's not the same a whiskey they have 51% of corn than a product they have 75, right? Or I mean, But this is where I argue the difference is like, I romanticizing the difference in whiskey builds, sure. But the reality is, from what I tasted, that's not what's going to give you your ultimate flavor. It's going to be how long in the barrel, what rack did it have in the warehouse, and then was your warehouse natural? Did it let the heat and cool of the seasons come in, or was it was it controlled? Well, that works, so right? It, it works. That works. That's part. It's such a defined process now because specifically, I, I mean, I can't speak to like the Scottish or Japanese necessarily, but in America, the rules are so defined as to what American bourbon and rye has to be, there's not a lot of room for playing. And that, just now we're starting to see some distilleries go out and actually play with unique ingredients that speak to the earth and speak to the time. But I look at mezcal and what I'm really fascinated to see is that mezcal, it's, it's not defined in the sense, like it's like the same as the rum world. The rum world is very loosely defined, but the, the people of Mexico have taken really a truly the meaning of terroir and time you know place and time in their their recipes for this so it's you know their recipes depend on one of a hundred different types of agave 
the recipes depend on whether they're blending that different types of agave. It depends on whether it's wild fermentation or inoculation. And what kind of still are they using? Like, are there heads or tails in the mix or is it just the body? Like, mm -hmm. it's so artisanal and it's so raw and real that for me as a bartender and someone who loves spirits and what I'm tasting out of there, you get a true snapshot of the person who's making this and what they care about. And then you talk to someone like yourself and who has all this information and can guide someone on this journey of different types of mezcals. That's really cool. We're getting into like wine territory or cognac territory. In certainly, certainly. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting what you said. And, and I will bring you in, in a very more uh, dangerous zone right now. When I will ask you what, 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 what you prefer, you prefer a brandy or you prefer a cognac? And so when I say like um, cognac, I guess I would say I do normally tend to drink cognac because I understand the amount of care that the hundreds and hundreds of years of the history of cognac has started to look at it. And so you think about whiskey and bourbon, they actually, I mean, bourbon specifically only has maybe not even 200 years of heritage and history. Cognac has some 500, 600. And so they've made the same mistakes. They've already and, and moved on from that. And it's a different setup. It's a different point of view from it. But they really understand that the grapes come from the land. And we've already had to change the type of grapes that they use in cognac more than once now because what used to work doesn't work anymore with our climate. And now the big conversation in the world of cognac is what's the next grape going to be? Because Ugni Blanc doesn't work as well as it used to especially in changing climate and stuff. And so what will be the next cognac grape? And there's a lot of exploration of that. Well, I, I will say um, I've been in Spain several times and I get fantastic brandies, fantastic, really great, great, great brandies uh, at the level of a cognac. But I always will pick a cognac. And, and you know why? Because I know the cognac have a, a denomination of origin and that is very important because they are regulated. So I think it's something that also the mezcal can bring to the public is the insurance that uh, where are you drinking is regulated yeah. so you have a regul a, a body who regulates you to uh as you say in your sticker okay this is this kind of agave and this is kind of alcohol content and i made it in this way what is riding in the level is totally the reality what you are drinking yeah. so as you said what is fascinating in mezcal is we are drinking as the same way they was drinking in uh, the colony of Mexico. So mezcal starts when, uh, this, is a, this is a great story. So me, me, the Spaniards came in Mexico, right? In 1590. Mm -hmm. So they bring with them uh, their knowledge and the savoir faire and the religion, the language, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a process of conquest, right? Mm -hmm. And they start getting in the different cities of Mexico and they bring with them a knowledge that was the um the stealer so this distiller was the arabic one that is the cooper copper that you see in oaxaca for example in the city of oaxaca for making a scar yeah. right but in the other side of mexico was a um, project that was conquer the philippines and they get out from mexico so they plan in they put the money and they put the troops and they send the troops from the pacific coast of mexico in colima they went to Philippines to conquer Philippines. So what they bring from Philippines, so they conquered Philippines and they came back from Philippines to Mexico before to go in Spain. And they brought the Philippine distiller. But not only that, right? Because the Philippines get from China, the, the, the distiller. And um, for far away than we can see, for sure we know that one of the older distillers than we know is the Chinese distiller they, they born around 3,000 years before Christ. Uh, we know much about 600, 500 years before Christ and 3,000, but I think they find something about this age. Maybe I'm a little wrong about the dates, but it's very old. So when they come in from Philippines, not only bring, brought this oven, they also brought the coconut. So when you go in, the, in Puerto Vallarta or any coast of Pacific of Mexico, or even in the coast of, of, of Florida, and you see these coconuts, you thinking they was there forever. But no, these coconuts came from Asia. And they was brought by these chiefs, they stopped first in Mexico. So when you bring these coconuts, also you brought 
some Philippine people that we call in Mexico the Indian Chinese Indians, los indios chinos. So you start to bring people that you colonize and you start to bring them to the other countries, right? So these people, they take some of the technology together, right? So this technology, man, is fantastic because they did in Philippines the coconut liquor. And they use in exactly the same system that you use for make the scalp. So when they bring the coconuts and they start to make alcohol with coconuts, certainly some of these guys that know how to do these spirits, they saw the agaves and they start to make them from agaves. And this is how the mezcal born between 16, 30, and uh, sorry, 15, 30, and 1600. That is where the mezcal is born. Some people believe that the, the Mexicans distill before the Spaniards. Yeah. It's, it's oh. possible, it's possible, I guess, it's yeah. possible, it's possible, but if you tell me they specifically the mezcal that we do before right now is not that is not possible because they don't if they use in a distiller they use in another kind of distiller they uh, is what they call the capacha there's like a baño maria you know baño maria is when you 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 cook with the with the steam yeah. so uh, it's proof that they they know this system of cooking but they this is not proof at all they they distill but it's interesting how you are drinking right now the mezcal that the same mezcal they was drinking in, in 1600. Yeah. So this is what is fascinating in, and fantastic in, in the mezcal. So, so the mezcal started to do part of the colony of Mexico. The name became Spaniard because we call it mezcali and the Spaniards hear mezcali, but they change it to mezcal. And also they call it vino de mezcal because vino because they have alcohol and mezcal because they was what they hear, right? Mm -hmm. So vino de mezcal. And tequila was a vino de mezcal industry. Yeah. So the guys of tequila, they start to doing vino de mezcal and they changed the tequila because the French came with this idea to get this denomination of origin. Mm -hmm. So the, the, these guys, they changed the name to tequila and they really make it uh, legal around the 1970s, 74, I guess, is when the, wow. finally they are recognized as, as, as a denomination of origin, even if the American accept that before because Mexico recognized the, the name of, of uh, uh, Bourbon, you know, and, and in exchange, the United States recognized the, the name of tequila. Yeah. So there was an, an exchange of the, uh, you don't do Bourbon, I don't do tequila, and I will respect the only tequila can be called from when you made it, and you respect that the Bourbon only can, can call if I made it myself, et cetera, et cetera. So th this, is, this is the way that we arrived to tequila changing their name and change their rules and make their own their own spirit very different on that was the root and mezcal lived there in the little towns totally forget for the people the people forget it all these people exchange it you know all these great artisans third generation and fourth generation of master distillers they never get a penny for their mezcal they exchange it for chicken they change it for pork they change it for food uh, I make the wedding for your daughter or your quinceañera, but you give, in exchange you give me a car or you will give me something for my quinceañera, et cetera, et cetera. Completely. So finally, finally with the boom de mezcal, all these families have something to get in their table. So a lot of people, they migrate to the United States because they don't see any possibility to get a penny in the mezcal. They start to coming back to their towns to do mezcal. Mm -hmm. And I start to getting money from this art. And also something that is fantastic and magic, let me tell you, is these guys are young and they start to innovate. Yeah. So these new mezcaleros, they don't do the same than their parents. They are adapting the, the, the mezcal for the new world, for, for the new enterprise. So some people, they are purists and say, no, my God, you don't have to change it. But the change is there. And the brands are changing, and they ch we are changing the flavor of the mezcal. When you come into a table and a bar in uh, Mississippi, in Alabama, in Georgia, right, with the people, they are not uh, really traveling, or they don't really want to have a, a spirit. They are very strong with these flavors of mezcal. They will be offensive. Uh, please take the word offensive, no, um, no in pejorative, but in regular, right, because the mezcal is 
explosing in your mouth and say, I don't want that, but I prefer that this new kind of mezcal that is a little more simple, more easy to drink. They have the agave notes because I don't want, because I'm not, uh, I was not exposed before to this kind of, of flavor, right? It's, uh, and I think, you know, coming from like the bar, <laughs> what was popular? And, you know, I think that's literally our entire world and our palates, you know, it's what you've been exposed to your entire life. And, and some things, it's baked into the culture. It's just, it's what you've expected. And so you look at really, really old cultures and the shit they have is flavorful whether it's the food, whether it's the, the alcohol, whatever. I mean, there's a lot that goes in there. You look at, you know, Chinese food or Mexican food or um, African food, and there's, there's spices in there, there's fermentation, there's, there's all this stuff going in there. And the people of that culture are used to eating that because it, that's how they made their stuff taste good. But then you go to these younger cultures and then we just haven't progressed that far yet. So we're not used to tons of spicy things or different spices that are combined in ways like curry and whatnot. We don't have fermentation in the sense of like um, sauces or hot sauces or, you know, um, like fish sauce from, you know, parts of Asia. We don't have that in our culture yet. And so you look at like bartending in, in America specifically and that bartending and cocktails really originated here. And, you know, up until the 1920s, it was bartenders fucking golden era. I mean, we were at the top of our craft. We knew what we were doing. We we're being paid big bucks and we were well-respected by our communities. And we were serving at the time we had, you know, whiskey, uh, whatever it came from. It could either be American bourbon or it could be from Scotland or Ireland. We had rum. Rum was extremely popular. Gin was extremely popular. And we had brandy. Um, cognac was a little bit harder to find right then because we had gone through phylloxera, I believe at that time, or uh, we're coming out of it. But I mean, that's what we had. So we had these big, bold flavors and then prohibition hit us and no one drank, they drank crap. And so we get out of pro prohibition and what people are used to drinking is crap. And then vodka comes on the scene in like the fifties and you know, it's just alcohol. There's no taste to it. There's no anything. And that's what the American palate picks up on is like, this is what we drink. And so from like the 1950s to like the 1980s, it's a vodka world. And it's these really simple drinks like gin and tonic, vodka soda, you know, and then you start getting in like this new cocktail era of shots, but it's still heavily gin, rum, and vodka based and vodka wins it all. I mean, there's in bartenders, we say vodka pays the bills and it still absolutely does. But then you get into like 1990s to 2000 something and cocktails start to come back and bartenders start to look into, you know, the old craft to find something new. We revisit history, you know, everything becomes new again. And they start playing with cocktails and there becomes this abhorrent hate in bartenders and cocktail bartenders for vodka because it doesn't add anything. There's nothing really to play on. And so most bartenders start looking for things that have a lot of flavor. And we go to whiskey, we go to, you know, because it's classic, it's American, it's whatever. And we go to rum, we go to gin and we go to tequila. And then um, Del Maguey comes out with these mezcals, which we kind of all knew what it was. We remember seeing it with the worm in and we never touched it. And all of a sudden, Del Maguey comes on the market with like this stuff. And for Oregon, it was a control state. I mean, it was 50 to like 70 bucks a bottle. And so only like the best cocktail bars would even dare put it on my menu. And if we did, it was a you know conversation with the owner and the bar manager of like, I, this is going to be a 50% cost cocktail. It's going to suck. But hey, it's important that we get this out there and we got to play with it. It's amazing and all that. And then Del Maguey launched Vita, which was a cost it was a cheap mezcal that we could use in cocktails. And so instantaneously, Del Maguey took that market immediately. And then all of a sudden, all these other brands started coming on, but it was like this flavor that no one had ever experienced before. It wasn't oaky like scotch. It wasn't peated smoky like, you know, Isla. It was smoky. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is a great point for, that you are, you are de doing there because when, when they start there, uh, and uh, Del Maguey start getting all the markets, they speak the language, uh, they are bringing the fantastic product with a story, etc. They was against the, the cocktails, right? No cocktails. We don't do cocktails. We don't get a warm in the bottle. We don't. Yeah. And, uh, but finally, they get out Vida because they was lost in the market. And, and this is, this is an, a, a romantic story. It's fantastic, but we, we, have, we shouldn't forget something that is very important. A lot of families eating about this art right so i don't have the right to 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 uh, come back to to my families in oaxaca say you know i don't sell any 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 mezcal because i have a worm and it's not 
it, it, the, the worm is uh, something that uh, somebody thinking is a, uh, a marketing product, so we will not sell that and you don't eat. No, I, I, need, to, I need to go and advocate why the, 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 the worm, right? And say, you know, the worm is it's a very old recipe and yes, a lot of people use it for marketing, but also they have this story and they have this behind and behind and behind. And, and because it's a business and families eating out of this business. You know, it's not a bad mezcal. It's just a different mezcals outside, and each person has the right to try any mezcal. Man, when I started in this business 10 years ago and I went to the bar, I promise I have bartenders they don't know what was mezcal. Yeah. And I start drinking. It's when I start drinking whiskey and learn about whiskey because the bartenders, you know how it is. When you are not in an appointment and you are in the night there and you sit in the bar, you want to talk with the bartender, you have to. You have to, to get some interest. You have to drink with him and you need to start talking about what he's passionate and everybody was passionate about whiskey. So they started explaining me because I was no mezcal to drink. Yeah. So I learned something very important is the best mezcal is what you have in front of you, man. And the worst mezcal was what is not there, right? So, so it's, it's uh, all, all these uh, experience and, and histories are, are are what are make what we are right now right so yeah. you have a, a, a 300 brands of, of uh, mezcal right now in the united states when we were only 20 or 30 10 years ago and i think i mean this is how i look at it and I, this is one of the things i romanticize about being a bartender and stuff is i feel like bartenders are kind of like the devil and we're the blasphemous bunch because we take these things that are um integral to someone's heritage whether it be mezcal, whether it be scotch, whether it be whatever. And, you know, I don't, I always like to say, like, look at the, the Manhattan cocktail. You know, nobody, nobody in Kentucky ever made their whiskey and like, we're going to mix this with Italian made sweet vermouth. <laughs> no Italian ever said, oh, put my, put my Italian sweet vermouth with that, that whiskey. Never, ever happened because they would have been like, absolutely not. My bourbon is perfect or absolutely not, my sweet vermouth is perfect the way it is. Don't you ever go fucking changing that. That's my heritage, that's my blah, blah, blah. And then bartenders looked at it from an outside perspective and said, you know what, those, things, those two things would go together really, really well. I'm gonna make a cocktail with that. And so we blended it and people started enjoying it, but because of that, they started reading and caring about whiskey. They started reading and caring about you know, sweet vermouth. And the same with, you know, when I look at this, like there's no culture that starts off making a liquor and then turns that liquor into a cocktail. Like we look at like um, in China right now, they have, you know, the most consumed spirit in the world. Um, why am I spacing the name right now? Um, um, the Hoshu, uh, the, this is what it's in corn. Uh, no, the, um, oh shoot, we're gonna post this thing. I cannot remember the name right now. Um, the Chinese spirit will come to me here in a second. Um, but anyway, like, that's 5,000 years of history that has been being made for. And there's no cocktails with it. Um, there's no cocktails being made with that spirit. And um, this is driving me nuts. I'm, thank God we have technology and I can look it up. Um, baiju. So there is no baiju-based cocktail because nobody in China is going to be like, oh, we're going to make a cocktail with this. But now all of a sudden they're like, we need to because we need to sell it outside of China and no one's going to try it and get into it. The story of Margarita, man. Yeah. And that's the thing is like the margarita was an American who took tequila and was like, I'll make a cocktail with this and made something. And then now all of a sudden it's like the, na it's the national beverage of like Jalisco. You go there and there's a Paloma here and there's a margarita there and there's a whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but it's, mm -hmm. it's this idea of nothing is sacred. That a bar when a bartender looks at nothing is sacred, nothing's too expensive or too yeah, yeah. pristine to be used as an ingredient. And we make it, which then makes it popular which then demands, you know, for, from you, hey, make Mezcal more accessible. And then you can have both your, you know, wild agave, but you can also have your Espadin agave that's mass produced and whatnot. And to me, I think that's the most important thing looking at Mezcal is to understand that there are those two things and they're both wonderful and amazing, but I'm probably not gonna take a Tobala Mezcal and use it in a cocktail. Like a no, of, course, no, of course not, yes. Yeah. I, 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 even even if it's free and you don't have to pay the cost, obviously not because you will destroy the flavor of this this agave. Uh, and I mean, uh, but uh, let me tell you something. Okay. When I started this business in Seattle, 
some people prepare cocktails with a, a high end spirit. Uh, I, I get uh, I get a really fantastic. I remember in the Liberty, I get a fantastic, fantastic, unforgettable uh, um, cocktail with a Madrequiche, but it's twenty eight dollars a cocktail, right? So when when it's prepared like this, you can say, okay, I will pay and I will get my cocktail. But I certainly, when I know the story of these wild agaves, how they are recollected, how hard it is. Uh, how hard it is for the nature, I will totally uh, recommend to the people to get the wild agaves neat and, and get the flavors. And if they want a chaser, they can get uh, uh, a chaser of sparkling water. I think is the best. I, I, when you talk about the margarita, I, I, I was ready to tell you that uh, in the industry, in my industry, we have all the, all the people is around try to find the mezcal margarita, right? Everybody's trying to find the cocktail they will make explode the cells of, of, of mezcal when it's there. Everybody cannot see it. It's just to get a chaser of water and you can, eat, you can drink mezcal all day long with a chaser of water in the side, right? Uh, uh, Topo Chico is there, man. Topo Chico is the perfect example of, of, of a fantastic water that don't have any flavor, any cells, and you can drink with mezcal there, you know? I would argue that in today's world, a brand or a category no longer needs a um, a cocktail, like the cocktail, because there's too many cocktails these days. There's too many different ones. You're, you're not gonna see these new ones. And cocktails are so connected to the bartender that created them. It's our ego that creates it. We're never gonna let it become just one brand. I think the big goal that any category should ever seek is to be in a well, to be on a menu, in the sense of like, if you're on a menu, then you know what? That's great because I think bartenders are going to so lowly go away from like cocktails that are a name and, and this way and blah, 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 blah. Like I, I feel personally, and this is my view and I'm sure there's, I'm going to get a lot of flack from this, but I view that bartenders hold themselves in the past and don't look at modern day technology and, and modern day techniques to take themselves further. They're stuck in the past. And so I think at some point in time that has to give. And then as long as you're an ingredient that they're going to use in a cocktail, because you're an ingredient that provides an amazing sense of flavor an amazing sense of time. And it gives a story as to why this cocktail was created in the first place. That, that is going to be your winning solution right there. And it's going to be bartenders who talk with like right now, what we're doing right now is talking and, mm -hmm. okay, and I'm learning so much about mezcal and the history of it. And also learning about like Oaxaca. I want to create cocktails that have something to say about what, like a time and place of what it means. And I want to research the ingredients and I want to create the story through the ingredients that speaks to the understanding that I'm gaining from you. That to me is the future of bartending. And that won't be a, a, a fancy name that you can go to any bar and have it made. That'll be only available at this one bar for a limited time. And it's going to be experience at the bar. And maybe you work together with that bartender to create a packaged cocktail with that brand and whatnot. But I don't think you're gonna see a margarita happen very often again, where it's, it, you think tequila, you think margarita, you think Paloma, you think these things. I, I don't see that happening that much anymore. I, I don't know, man, let's go see if, um, I always, uh, I am very controversial when I say $2 margaritas are okay. You know, oh. you, cannot, you, can, you cannot change their mind of the people they want to drink a nice cocktail for two dollars. You yeah. know, you, you cannot change. You you need to explain, and I always explain to the people, hey, you know what you have for two dollars? Is you know what kind of meat you get in McDonald's for one dollar hamburger? You know how, what kind of tequila you will get from a two dollars uh, tequila? If you don't care, if you love to go to McDonald's or you love to get a two dollar margarita, go ahead. It's your body, is your money, be happy. Mm -hmm. I will not be unhappy for you, right? Uh, but obviously, I will be the person to, when I go to your bar and you offer me a margarita, I will ask you what kind of tequila you use in your, in your margarita, if I have, I, I have the right to upgrade your margarita for another kind of tequila, right? And this is when the things start to be very nice because you start yeah. a dialogue with the bartender, right? And they ask you, why do you prefer this tequila to the other one? I will recommend you this one because they have these notes I can upgrade you to this other, but this is the first time I hear somebody to, to ask me for El Tesoro. Why El Tesoro 
and all this one. And, and, and you start a dialogue with the people that is fantastic. And I think they can happen to a Manhattan. They can have it with a Margarita. And, and yes, I, I totally see, as you see, the industry change it a lot. Uh, certainly will change it. Uh, the people are reticent to change, you know. I really tried to work in Zoom with my distributor for years, man. Nobody tell me, yes, let's go do it. Now that we don't have another solution, yes, I work a lot in Zoom with, the, with these people, right? Mm -hmm. but, but before not, and we have this technology forever. So this Zoom is no new. They don't born in, in the pandemic. They was there a long time ago. So the people is stop changes. They don't like to change very fast. But certainly we will we will arrive to a moment that uh, you will be a protagonist in your own cocktails. And I, I would love to see that, man. And uh, certainly we'll see you there because you are one of the more talented bartenders that I, I, I met in, in Portland. And, and, and uh, these conversations about gin and these fantastic cocktails that you're your cocktails menu that you make in your in your um, when you have your uh, cocktail special days uh, with the qualification for the people, etc., was brilliant, man. So I I I see the kind of interaction that we were talking about, right? To make their 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 public be part of their cocktail and parts of the menu of the places they want to be. And I mean, I guess when I think about like moving forward, and this is where I want to segue into like what is the future for Mezcal, but. I see that bars and restaurants, I, I feel that we're kind of in this bubble and it's been popped now. And so there won't be as many bars and restaurants as there have been in the past, which is both sad and also kind of exciting because I hope that this finally gives, you know, when you go home and I mean, you're at home right now and you're gonna cook dinner, like you have a probably, I'm guessing a fairly decent knowledge of how to cook. You know how to cook a steak, you know how to cook some chicken, you have some recipes handed down by your family or by your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your whatever. I hope that cocktails have the same importance in people's homes that culinary cooking and, and whatnot has in their homes. And so I hope that things like a margarita, a Manhattan, like these names that we all understand and know will have their place in people's homes. The same as how to make, you know, a, a pancake or how mm -hmm. to make, you know, the recipes might vary differently between, you know, what they've found works for them. Mm -hmm. But I hope that everyone has it someday the tools and the knowledge on how to do all that. Because then when you go to a bar, it can be something truly special. And it can be something that that team has worked on to make. And they don't have to necessarily play to the cocktails that everyone just wants. You will have something truly special at that restaurant when you go there at that bar. And those cocktails that every, you know, the margarita in Manhattan, the sidecar, all those things, those are able to be made, but most people have them at home. And if you want to go back and enjoy a margarita, home that's something that you can make at home because it is simple it is delicious but mm -hmm. when you go to a restaurant it allows us to take the idea of a margarita and to rethink it or to think of something completely different to go into like right now what i'm doing on my end is i'm looking into waters and i'm taking waters and i'm messing with them on a molecular structure of how much salt and does the water itself have any acidity to it so and you said Topo Chico earlier, like I think that Topo Chico is this really cool water that comes from the earth. The earth has literally compressed minerals and salt into this water and then somehow carbonated it naturally. Like how cool is that? And so looking at taking water either naturally from the ground or even naturally from the ground and then manipulating it further to be a specific flavor, to move and work with a specific beverage, to me, not necessarily water, but that's the future of thinking about time and place and where it comes from and pairing ingredients that really show off the spirit. And so in that way, I'm just taking water that then I mix it with a mezcal, but I've taken that water so that when I mix it with the mezcal, it shows off the best parts of the mezcal. And that water mm -hmm. has been either naturally found and it just works that way, or it's been made to have just the right mineral content so that it makes the mezcal perfect. That's the kind of high level stuff that you can't do at home yet. And yeah, exactly, exactly. You need a professional to help you with yeah, this part. So the next level of bartending, the next level of, of the culinary world that is bars is being held back, in my opinion, because we have to continually create these cocktails that I think everyone should have the knowledge to make on their own at home. And I think if you want to go out for an experience at a restaurant, it should be something truly special and truly like eye-opening and, and connecting you back to what it means to dine and eat together as a community and whatnot. And that can either be by enjoying a spirit that is so well made that you can enjoy it without any water or without a mixer, or mm -hmm. because the bartender has taken that to a completely new level 
and made it to be something that's unique and eye-opening for both someone who made the spirit themselves or someone who just is drinking it for the first time. Yeah. And, man, it, at the same time, that's the world I want to head towards is something that's truly unique in whatever bar, restaurant I'm a part of. It's and, certainly the alcohol is proving right now that it's part of our culture. Oh, yeah. Is part of our way to live. Uh, you know, the pandemic didn't stop the consumption of alcohol; they accelerated. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, I, I see certainly uh, progress, uh, technological progress, uh, human progress, and talent progress in in the way that we will drink it in the future. I don't think we will never finish to drink this alcohol in powder. <laughs> it was horrible. I but uh, but but certainly we will we will enjoy different kinds of spirits and I think mezcal will be part of the alcohols and we will drink after pandemic a lot because the people will appreciate much more and more and more these alcohols they are natural uh -huh. uh, if we can call in this way you know we don't have any yeast when we uh, when we uh, ferment in uh, the process of school and also the mezcal have this regulation right so you are sure that the mezcal is still made in the way they're supposed to be made because you have a, 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 regulator, a regulator body to take care of, of that part. And, and uh, I, I think it's, a, it's an extra point for the mezcal and uh, for the consumers, right? And I mean, that's to end this conversation on that note, like maybe 10 more minutes on this conversation. Like I want to know about the future of mezcal because I look at this whiskey bubble that's currently existing right now and I think it's going to pop literally any day now and if i'm a betting person you know my choices are kind of three things it's either going to be rum tequila and or um brandy and rum as much as i would like to say is going to be the next whiskey i don't think it will be because i just don't it's not there yet um at least here in oregon i just don't see it happening but i look at tequila and i look at mezcal and i go whoa something really is interesting happening and for you know, botanists specifically, we sell a lot of tequila and we sell a lot of mezcal. And now that we're upstairs in our new space, like we sell even more mezcal and more tequila than we ever had before. And it's a trend that, you know, we didn't really cause, but you just look at the cocktails on our menu and those are what is selling right now. And so I think that we're headed in a trend and maybe this is just a micro shot or micro shot of Portland or Oregon, but I see the, the desire for people to connect with tequila and, and mezcal is growing immensely. And so I have both a fear and a hope that mezcal is the future because that would be a, a spirit that I truly believe is connected to the people and to the planet. And so I guess the, kind of the last few minutes I want to talk to you about is sure. Sure. What, what is the state of Oaxaca right now? And like, what are some things that we need to look out for? What are some warning signs? Um, and how do we move forward? Well, um, I, I think I think what you are seeing is is, is uh, certainly true. Um, mezcal is there, and the people are the more and more interesting, and the people are getting uh, different brands, and they are already testing different products. Uh, we didn't say that today, but we understand it. Uh, the mezcal is like a wine, right? Each producer, each grape, or each agave, or each master distiller. They are able to give you different flavors, even if we are talking about the same agave. Yeah. And the people are getting that part. So I buy this bottle, I buy this other. And as we say it already, the, the alcohol culture is there and the people want to drink the more on more natural stuff. And it's where the mezcal is coming there. And they say, I'm here. You are drinking something that is still with a, a, an apparatus that was the same that uh, using 400 years ago, 500 years ago. So you can have that. I don't play with plates for, for change flavor, for get the gases out. It's what it is, is what the plant is able to give you. Right now, while well, we're going to the boom of the mezcal, where a lot of a, uh, producers are born and they start to come in. Uh, most of the brands that you see in the United States, they owned by Americans, right? We are not too many uh, brands to are uh, owned by Mexicans. That means, and it's nothing to do with the nationalities, it has to do with the investment capacity, right? So when you have millions of millions of dollars to put in, in, a, in the marketing of your product, those hombres, for example, the two big actors of Hollywood buy a brand of mezcal, right? And the mezcal maybe is good, 
but whatever is good or not, they will sell a bunch because you have all this publicity behind them. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, that certainly will play in the future of the mezcal. And you will see the more and more artists and famous people buy brands and try to impose it in the in the in the taste of, of of the market so we will we will we will finish to have our don julios and our uh, uh herraduras in the mezcal certainly certainly and but i think we will still be several brands they will try to keep it our authenticity and we will still working hard to keep in the market with this product right uh, so i think you will have these two kinds of of, of mezcal they are the mezcal they are independent and you will have this mezcal they are supported by big brands or by big corporations you can call them um Sazerac, a uh, yeah. whatever a, a pernod ricard or whatever you think is, is is okay because all the brands now bacardi have their own brand of mezcal uh, pernod ricard Sazerac, uh, everybody have now their, their own brand. So um, those, they will be certainly dominate the market because they know how to do it because they have the money, they have the marketing and it's okay. But what's happening in Oaxaca? What's happened with all these agaves, right? So the price of the agave certainly go up, right? So the little brands as mine is the most and more difficult by the agaves if you don't have it, right? So we are investing in agaves because we need to have our own because we cannot compete against against the dollars of uh, Pernod Ricard, right? Yeah, no. So uh, we we need we need to to work on that. So now we have also the Spadin. Spadin is king in the United States, and it's king everywhere because it's the state agave, is the agave that you have easily uh, in your uh, bars, and um, also you have the the the, ag the wild agaves. But also you have a lot of brands they brought uh, wild agaves because they also want the, a little market of the luxury. They are mezcals they cost you around between eighty dollars and hundred and fifty to hundred dollars a bottle, and it's very difficult, very complicated. And also we need to be sustainable. And this is this is when not all the brands are sustainable. So not all the brands uh, reforest. Not all the brands are respectful of the years of the agaves because when I talk about Spadil. And you have the people to take it at five years is their problem their their mezcal will be not really good but is their problem it's a it's a state agave easy yeah. right but when you're talking about a 13 14 15 20 uh tepestate or 35 years old agave and when you take it before time you don't let their time to make babies you don't like the time to get ajuelos you don't let them time to grow in right so you are destroying all the uh, ecosystem around these, these agaves and this is what we need to be very careful because uh, the um, greed all these producers they can they can destroy the future of, of the kids in the mezcal and we will not have enough wild agaves in the future to bring more more uh, these beautiful agaves to the tables now how many people really buy these bottles of, of, of mezcal the, the big problem that we have and I will tell you is the people are not drinking what is bottled and they still bottle more and more and more. If you go in a bar, uh, let's go see in Portland, an uh, uh, old bar, all kind, this bar, they start with the mezcal uh, 10 years ago. And you go in the bar, you will see they have exactly the same bottles than 10 years ago because then nobody drink it, these super expensive agave. So they have all the collection of one brand, all the collection of the other brand, all the collection of the brand, and they don't have a space for the new brands at all. Yeah. And they, they have dust in these bottles. And nobody drinks these bottles because it's $40, $30, $25 a shot. Right? So, and you have a new brand of a kind of artist, of a kind of, I don't know who, to start getting more and more tepestates and more tobalas and more madre quiches. And they bring them in the United States. And they are in line behind these bottles. They are in these bars waiting for one bottle to get out for put it there, the new one. Right, and the production is more and more. So, recommendation: please drink it, <laughs> drink what is bottled, because we have a greed of people, a greedy people. They are making more and more and more mezcal right now, and this mezcal they, we don't need it. Yeah. So a lot of people are sitting in the stock of wild agaves, and this is not okay. So I think if we don't change our politics, 
if we don't change our consumption, if we are not changed the way we producers, we respect the nature, if we don't change the way that we consumers, we respect what we are drinking, uh, we will be in troubles in an early future. And that's kind of like where I'm, um, that's what I feared. And that's exactly what I thought in the sense that, um, to me, if you think about it, like you look at a Macallan 25 year old scotch, this is a thousand dollars a bottle and people still buy it because it's popular because they know what it is and because it has a brand on it. But a Tepesate Mezcal is a hundred dollars a bottle and it took 25 years for that agave to mature. So the mm -hmm. same process just on the opposite ends of the spectrum happened. But the price difference is so amazing. I mean, just 10 times the difference. 10 times, yeah. I mean, that terrifies me. Same. Yeah, tequila. tequila is the same. The most expensive bottle of tequila never had to be with the most expensive bottle of mezcal. No. I mean, you have Fuente Seca now. You have these, you know, hundreds of dollars of bottles of, of amazing tequilas coming out that are extra añejo this and that. And I go, fuck. No, like, you, have, you have bottles of tequila with diamonds, man. Yeah, I mean, the, where, the, where the quality of the tequila is nothing. No, but no, no. what is valuable is the bottle, is the brand. You know, Casa Dragon is 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 a is a is a tequila that some people like it, some other people don't like it. I don't care, but this is made with the diffusers, yeah. and it's three hundred dollars the bottle. Or it was, I think they they come down with the price, but when they start, it was three hundred dollars a bottle of, of of tequila made with diffusers, because marketing, marketing is king. And that's, yeah, and that's the terrifying thing that I look at the future of Mezcal is it's like, here is this amazingly authentic product, this amazingly artisanal product. And I can see the future. I can see the future in the sense of like, it can, I, it can go either way. And it can go the tequila way of making a $200 bottle of Casa Dragones. That's, I mean, sorry, Casa Dragones, if you ever watched this, but it's crap. Absolute crap. It's, it's made by speeding up a process and then using chemicals to make up for your shoddy work. No, but some people like it and it's okay. You know, I don't care. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's not because you and me, we don't like it that other people don't like it. But it's just, this, is, this is sometimes the sad, uh, sadness well, of the market. The people love Jack and Coke. Man. Yeah, but there's they a love that. <laughs> vanilla ice cream is vanilla ice cream, right? I can buy the cheap bottle or cheap thing of vanilla ice cream that uses vanilla flavoring extracts and it still tastes like vanilla ice cream, or I can spend more money and I can buy the real vanilla bean ice cream. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a question of like, what do you actually know about it? Or for me, it being yeah. a honey nerd, I know yeah. about honey. Where, where you want to spend your money. Yeah, exactly. Right? But I, right. I want to spend money on an yeah. authentic honey that actually comes from a specific place, yeah. uses real bees and blah, 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 as opposed to a chemical additive one that isn't necessarily yeah. honey. You, you as a bartender, this is the difficult question. You as a bartender, you have 10 people in the bar. How much of these 10 people really care what they drink, right? The others, they just to go for have a, and I think have a fun time, but what they really, really care what they are drinking. So and this is the average of you need to know America right that gets into um, a key thing that I believe in and, and who I am I believe in education I believe in understanding and I believe in sharing the knowledge that I have and I don't want to carry items that I don't believe in in my bar and so if I find out that the practices that are used for this let's just use tequila as an example because it's it's really split down the middle mm -hmm. I do not carry diffuser tequilas and if I find out that the tequila is diffuser, I will no longer carry it because I do not believe in giving my guests that option to put their money into that because it is not what I stand for. And okay. anyone who asks for that, I will Fair enough. Fair enough. And say, I'm sorry, I do not carry that brand. If you care to know why, I will explain to you. But this would be a comparable brand that I would recommend that you buy and put in your margarita or whatever. And anything on the menu is something that I really believe in and something I want to show off and care about. Um, and of course that comes into the brands that do have money to promote their stuff and whatnot. But at the same time, there are standards that I will not go below. And I believe it is every bartender's responsibility, same as every chef and whatever, to inform yourself and then practice what you preach and then carry the products that you care about 
And if you don't care about a product, then don't care. Because you're going to just, you feed into people's stupidity and you feed into their desire to not care. And that's not forgivable in my mind. You are enabling someone to continually be an idiot. And instead of taking them aside and going, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna enable you anymore. I'm going to educate you. And if you still don't care, then can, you know, continue to buy your mezcal tequila, whatever you, you know, care, whatever you don't care about, by all means. I'm not saying yeah. don't go to McDonald's, but I'm saying when you come to my bar, I'm going to force you to care because I care. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to allow you because you are my guest in, in my house to not put the crap in your body when it's already an alcoholic poison. I'm going to force you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I get this point, but it's, it's really nice of you to just spend time educating your people. But again, all these people of these 10 people that guess that you want, who, how much are really care about what you will educate them, right? Yeah. So this is, this is the point and that's happened in all, all the bars in America. So and $3 margarita is, yeah, for a lot of people. And I mean, here's the, the difference, Eduardo, is like, before COVID, you came into a bar and you educated the bartender and some of them got it, some of them didn't. And sometimes you have to spend a little more effort educating certain ones and getting them to care. And they just take a little more time. They need a little extra special loving. But eventually you get through and then the bar carries it and the bar talks about it and it's on the back bar and then eventually it makes its way into a cocktail on the menu. But it took your time to come in and teach, say me, about it. But then... I have to teach the guest about it. And it's one person at a time. And that's why I think that something like what we're doing right now has serious value because this is no longer teaching one person at a time. It's giving the option to as many people who want to sit through this conversation and talk about it and listen that's to fantastic. it. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's like, the future, right. Is, I think. And you know what? The reality is, you know, we're, 10 people are going to listen to this. You know what? Maybe one person's minds change. But last I checked, we have almost 8 billion people in the world one out of 10 is not a pretty, that's a pretty good option. That's a pretty good percentage in the world when we think about it, of people who care. And I think that's enough to sustain these small brands that care. And I think that having bartenders who are willing to go on a, a recorded Zoom and brands who are willing to be really open and transparent and talk about the future like this, this is the difference that we can make because reality is I'm never gonna have enough money to do what a big brand does to market the crap out of something. And, and I mean, maybe you will someday, maybe you will, I don't know. But this is the, you know, this is the difference is you have two experts in their field who care greatly about what they do and care greatly about what they, they give to their guests and their friends and their family and the people who come into their quote unquote house that is their bar. And for me specifically, I want to share that love that I've learned over the years to have and that appreciation respect I've learned to have for these spirits and knowing that it is a poison and it is going to get me drunk and it is, can cause problems. If I'm going to drink it, it better be fucking amazing. And I better really believe in it. And I better care about it because I am choosing to put that poison in my body, knowing that it is not great, but I love it. And I love what it stands for. And I love the idea of this romance that what are spirits and water of life and everything that that is. And so I think that, we can sit here and we can be down on ourselves and say, well, you know, only one in 10 people are going to care. Great. Let's start there because we can sit and we can start on something on, on faith to just try and change people's minds and change people's hearts. To uh, um, I, I with you, man. hundred percent. Well, with that, thank you very much for your time, Eduardo. Let's, let's do this again. Let's, let's talk. Any, any, any time, any time. And uh, maybe, maybe next time you can come into my program uh, that I have each Friday.